Coming up, it's International Week of the Deaf. We visit with the Meskwaki woman about her work to improve the planet and her efforts to raise awareness about the deaf community. Plus, a look at the native vote in special elections. Now that the California recall election is settled, what are tribes looking forward to in the next election? I'm Patty Tholohungva. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from Indian Country Today. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. Working with award-winning professors, Cronkite students learn news reporting, social media, shooting and editing videos, and producing content for communications industries. Cronkite's 15 professional programs give students the opportunity to cover critical issues throughout the U.S. and beyond. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. is Indian Country Today. Esquilly, yes, eh, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tholohungva. As the Delta variant rates soar among kids, the drug maker Pfizer says its COVID-19 vaccine works for children between the ages of 5 and 11. This jump in pediatric infections is a big concern for Indian Country. According to the data, after their second dose, children developed coronavirus fighting antibody levels as strong as antibodies in teenagers. Experts say getting youth vaccinated is critical. Dr. Lyle Ignace is the CEO of a native health center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He says the new vaccine has great potential for Indian country. Having this information come out now, especially with its profile and its um, uh, of efficacy, this is going to this is going to be this has a great uh, potential impact to diminishing the transmission of, of COVID in, in our native communities. The drug maker is expected to submit data to the Food and Drug Administration for emergency approval by the end of September. If that happens, children could start getting vaccinated as early as the end of October. Indigenous people are questioning the amount of media attention being given to a young white woman who went missing recently. The body of 22-year-old Gabby Petito was found this past weekend in Wyoming following a massive search by several agencies. Her death is being ruled a homicide. Petito was on a cross-country trip with her fiancé this summer but never returned to her Florida home. Her disappearance was posted on social media and shared widely. The speed and concern to which her case has been handled is now front and center for advocates of missing and murdered indigenous people. According to research by the University of Wyoming, the state recorded 710 cases of indigenous people who have gone missing since 2011. Lynette Graybull is a longtime advocate of this cause and lives in Wyoming, where Petito's body was found. She says she wants to see equal efforts to find missing people. Um, let's move forward and make sure that when an indigenous person goes missing or found murdered, that we have the same efforts that Petito received. Um, and how can anybody say no to that is, is my question. There are two tribal nations in Wyoming. The first case of COVID-19 is being reported on the U.S. territory of American Samoa. The case was discovered last week. It apparently happened on a flight from Honolulu to Pago Pago. Those flights had been suspended as a precaution due to the pandemic. When the flight resumed last week, an infected passenger was apparently on board. Officials say that person was fully vaccinated and had tested negative before flying. The territory's governor was on the same flight and now is in quarantine. In South Dakota, employees with the Oglala Sioux Tribe Ambulance Service are out of a job. They say the Indian Health Service abruptly let them go without notice. In early August, the employees staged a walkout due to staff shortages and low wages. Workers start at $8.89 an hour. Shortly after, IHS released a statement saying it would resume ambulance services. According to KOTA, the Oglala's territory covers more than 2 million acres of land, making it the third busiest for ambulance services in the state. A supervisor for the ambulance service, Michelle Hawk Hagen, says because of the wide area they have to cover, even when they are fully staffed, they can't be everywhere. 
The OST ambulance staff needs 43 medics to be fully staffed, but only have 16. Congratulations go out to a native Hawaiian poet who is one of the winners of the 2021 National Poetry Series competition. Nua Revilla is the first native Hawaiian poet to win the competition that had more than 1,600 entries. She was chosen as one of the five total winners. Revilla will have a full-length collection of her poetry published by Milkweed Editions. She is openly gay and says when she was young, she didn't have access to books written by gay Hawaiian women. So she feels lucky that her work will be recognized. Her book will likely be published next year. In the meantime, she'll continue to teach writing as an assistant professor at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. And those are the headlines for Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Thalahungva. The White House is turning to a Meskwaki woman to address the priorities of Native people who are disabled. Plus, mobilizing the native vote in special elections. We'll see what's ahead for tribes in California now that the gubernatorial recall election has passed. It is International Week of the Deaf. Today, we're joined by Sarah Young Bear Brown. She's a Meskwaki professional whose work aims to advance Native people, and she's also a prominent deaf advocate. We're also joined by Amber Braithwaite. She is a Crow Creek and has served as an American Sign Language interpreter today. Welcome, Sarah and Amber. Hi, yes, hello. But my name is Sarah Young Bear Brown. This is the sign for Meskwaki. I'm very happy to be here today and to have this discussion with you and in honor of the International Deaf Awareness Week. Um, it tends to be the last week of September annually. Let's start by talking about public policy and uh, your role as vice chair of the Native American Democrats in Iowa. Yes, yes. <laughs> That is accurate. Um, we actually just voted as the vice chair for the Iowa Democratic Party. Um, that is for going forward for 2022. It was a wonderful opportunity to be involved in the political world, uh, to learn more as a deaf indigenous woman, um, to be experiencing that intersectionality within the process as I grow and uh, the gains that we have been able to achieve for ourselves as an indigenous community and as a deaf community and having all of that come together in my ability to contribute to my society. It's been a very rich experience for me so far, and I've really enjoyed the traveling and meeting everyone as well. Iowa is such an important place, and your role is so important. Maybe talk about what it's like being out in the community. Wow, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, I'm really grateful to a particular person I'd like to mention today. Her name is Christina. Her last name is Black Cloud. Uh, something to remember is that Christina, uh, she ran for herself for the House of Representatives in the state of Iowa. And she has actually been my inspiration and in wanted to become involved in the political side of things. And she actually encouraged me to go ahead for the vice chair of the Native American Caucus of the IDP, the Iowa Democratic Party. Uh, but to be involved in the, in political uh, events as they are at this level, I would not have done that without her. And to be able to increase the awareness of both the indigenous community and the deaf community and bring that into the political arenas of the state of Iowa, it's been wonderful. And I'm absolutely willing to learn more as a deaf woman, um, not only about my culture as a deaf person, but also as my uh, indigenous peoples as well. So it's been a very, very wonderful opportunity. 
I understand the White House has recently uh, brought you in to um, talk about your role. Uh, maybe talk about what you're working with the White House on. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. I, I sure can do that. Uh, there at the White House, uh, they invited me to be a part of what they call the Roundtable. And that is basically focused on uh, indigenous, excuse me, Native Americans with disabilities or the disabled Native American population. Uh, what kind of struggles are being faced? What kind of barriers are there in front of us or being placed before us? Uh, there were a lot of experiences uh, that I had during my college years where I would, uh, for example, I'd go to class and there would be no sign language interpreter and trying to understand was a very big struggle for me. And I've been profoundly deaf uh, since I was born. I've always communicated with American Sign Language. So it was a real struggle for me and to be in class and not be able to understand, not having that interpreter and that bridge, um, bridging the gap of communication for me has been a struggle. But you know that has been a struggle throughout my life, almost an everyday experience. I also want to ask you about your work with the um, missing and murdered indigenous women in Iowa and nationally. I'd be happy to discuss that, sure. Um, in social media, what, what we're seeing is really not a lot of accurate information. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of provision of uh, equal access to that communication, such as American Sign Language. And so what I did was I went ahead and took it upon myself to start offering blogs. Those are video blogs, basically. Um, I started with topics on MMIW. Um, basically, what I wanted to do is I wanted to increase the education. Uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women is a very large issue for our community. And there tends to be a lack of information within the deaf community. We don't have access to the same vicarious learning. And especially in the indigenous community, there seems to be a lack of education. And so I decided to just go ahead and share the information that I had access to. And I used the social media platforms in order to do that. So I might include some uh, protest information. I might discuss rallies. Uh, there might be, well, I did mention the day of awareness for MMIW, but there's been a variety of topics that I've been able to share education on. Well, what is kind of the perception of uh, the native community and the deaf community and vice versa among each other? And what are the kind of conversations that are important to have? Sorry, one second. Got a little one here that needed something. Well, I realized in the deaf community, uh, there's a lot of information that we don't know about, uh, such as Native American history, uh, our own indigenous history. There were uh, many, um, many of us that weren't even aware that other Native Americans existed. And even like our sign language, let me, let me back up to that. Our sign language is based on Plains Indian Sign Language, PISL. And it is, uh, <laughs> It is our connection to the soil. It is, it's a part of who we are. And it's very sad that the deaf community does not have an identity that connects with that. And it's really important that we make more people aware of Plains Indian Sign Language and how it relates to American Sign Language, because we are able to see there's, there's influence from PISL on ASL currently, but we have to bring those things to light. Now, with Native American community, We've noticed that they're not super focused on the ADA laws, uh, disability rights. Uh, there wasn't enough focus for the deaf community to feel supported. And when I went to a Native American college, for example, as I mentioned earlier, there was no provision of a sign language interpreter. And I had to continuously ask for that interpreting services as I've gone forward working with the Native American community myself as a deaf woman. So. It seems more lacking in information is, has been what's been the main problem. And so I've been spending my time educating. And I mean, there, there are two worlds. The intersectionality of that is, is <laughs> it's overwhelming. There's a lot to do. There's a lot to pull into one package and try to present that to the world and try to uplift and edify both communities. 
but I, I know that's not going to end. That's going to keep going. And I don't, well, at least until my turn is, is done, but I don't know when that will be. I'm intrigued by um, how to reach out from communities to um, educate others. And one part of that would be, um, you mentioned interpreters, but what about making sure that more people from the hearing world have access to interpretation or have access to sign language and learn it as part of the curriculum so that it's just an ordinary thing for us? You know, that would be best. <laughs> there are many colleges um, in contemporary times, I should say. There are many community colleges in everyone's area, really all over the country that provide American Sign Language classes. So if someone really wants to learn the language, they just need to be assertive and go out there and look up where their local resources are and get involved. Many of the community colleges offer those classes though. And there's also a lot of involvement in activism that we encourage as well. Uh, for example, line three in the state of Minnesota, uh, we were just there at White Earth. And the whole point obviously was to stop the oil pipelines from continuing. And so I joined that effort. They were able to provide us with sign language interpreters uh, there were people who knew some sign that were not interpreters, but were aware of the deaf community. And <laughs> I very much enjoyed my time with their community. And it was wonderful to see people using sign language and to feel included and be able to fully participate in the events. Has the pandemic been a challenge or has it made things easier? Well, uh, it has actually allowed a lot of exposure of indigenous uh, traditions. A lot of information about reservations has been shared because there's not a lot of education set up on reservations for these particular topics. Um, it's hard for them to find um, good, reliable Wi-Fi connection, you know, good internet connection, things like that. There's a disparity, obviously, in what is available, um, even if they do have um, what do I say, progressive movement happening on the reservation. It's very slow movement. Often there will be deaf folks um, on the reservation, but they're very isolated. Perhaps their family doesn't know sign language at all. And so they don't go to school. Uh, they stay at home. They don't get any social exposure or activity. And so it's very hard for them to even practice the sign language that they know. Um, I myself, I have a deaf daughter and I can't imagine her being a part of the family that doesn't sign. Uh, she's now attending the Iowa School for the Deaf. And, you know, as a child, she's enjoying that social opportunity and the growth and the ability to learn sign language even further. It's been a very, very cool experience for us so far. We only have about a half a minute left, but what do you want to see for her daughter, your daughter? Oh, I just want her to have success. <laughs> I want her to be happy in what she does. Um, that's really the priority for me. I want to see my children to, I want them to be happy. That's, you know, that's all I can wish for them to be. I want them to see what I have been able to accomplish and to be able to move from that. And I, I do have two children. I should probably mention that. I have a son and a daughter as well. Well, let me close by uh, what can we do to uh, celebrate or learn more about the International Week of the Deaf? Well, you know, actually, if you take a look at the website, I believe it is the World Federation of the Deaf. Uh, they've got all of the events listed for this week. Um, we are in partnership with NAD, the National Association of the Deaf. Um, you can also look at the NAD website for further information about um, International Deaf Awareness Week. Uh, we have deaf business owners, deaf entrepreneurs, deaf CEOs. We have resources put together for deaf community members to be able to take advantage of. Uh, we have ASL classes uh, listed there so that folks that want to learn American Sign Language can go ahead and, and pursue those opportunities. Pretty much everything we have to offer is right there on the website. Sarah, thank you so much, and Amber as well. Thank you so much. And we'll be right back.
There are more than 100 federally recognized tribes in California, and recently they went to the polls to decide whether or not to recall the governor. Here to give us some insight on the native vote is Holly Cook Macaro. She's a partner with Spirit Rec Consulting and is a regular contributor to our news program. Welcome, Holly. Thanks, Mark. It's good to see you. So let's pull back. It was late in the campaign and tribes weighed in and said they'd really like to keep the governor. Yes, which is a different spot than I think where um, Native voters were, like much of the rest of the electorate in the state of California in the midsummer, when there was confusion about um, the recall, that it was both the recall and an election, and going along with the, those polls that showed kind of a lack of awareness about um, overall about the effort, both in Indian country and throughout the state. Um, were some numbers that put Governor Newsom in, in a real danger zone. So those polls, I think, um, pulled everyone together, um, both the state party um, and tribal leaders in engaging and uh, most of the support going to Governor Newsom um, in terms of the financial support. I haven't seen any breakdown of the voting numbers yet, but and um, both on the voter and the tribal leader side, uh, really, I think, amped up towards the end, like much of the rest of the state of California. Um, this recall was really much more interesting than it needed to be because of those, those polls, and I think that lack of awareness. But um, like I said, the significant financial support went to Governor Newsom, very little to the multitude of Republican candidates that were on that side of the ballot, should the recall have been uh, successful, which as we now know it wasn't. Um, and beyond that, you know, tribal governments in the state of California are really some of the more um, politically experienced um, in the country. They've waged and won uh, six or seven statewide ballot initiatives themselves. They um, were watching this very closely, mostly looking at the at at the experience with Governor Newsom, where there's a level of education and fami familiarity because of those things that um, those issues and responsibilities that lie with the governor, like gaming compact negotiations, um, being a leading voice on, on things like the California Truth and Healing Council, and um, and really leading the way and, and having that, that base of education and, and knowledge on tribal issues. So those things, I think, all brought tribes to the table and, um, and eventually in support of Governor Newsom. One of the extraordinary things about the California uh, recall process is structural, and that is how few people can determine the outcome. And that has huge implications for Indian country, just that idea. Yes, it does. While California is home to more Native Americans than any other state in the country, California is also the most populous state in the country. So really just a blip on the radar in terms of percentage of the vote. But again, Tri the tribes in the state of California, because of the statewide ballot initiative process, which they have engaged in successfully, uh, again, six or seven times over the last 25 years, the uh, it has allowed for a level of, of you know, I think public engagement um, that, that has facilitated tribal efforts. So, um, and also provided that foundation and necessity for the, the engagement on the tribal side. That experience, I think, has provided that um, political evolution and sophistication that we see today. I, I think this race is really being, the recall is really being examined very closely all across the country. Uh, majority Native American uh, districts or, or concentrated areas of population that could look at as well in terms of turnout, but with the 111 federal recognized tribes in the state, the native population is is diverse and, and spread out throughout the state. So sometimes getting those numbers and their effects on actual races can be difficult, but we can look to, um, I think, we can look to the pockets of the deeply blue areas, like San Francisco, the LA area, uh, and we can also look to those pockets of very conservative areas in the state of California, like the Central Valley, the Inland Empire, and Southern California, um, for some clues to the 2022 midterms. And I think most of the country will be reading the tea leaves for those clues. We have less than a minute left, but I want to go from California to Washington. The White House has announced a new White House conference 
Uh, this is exciting for tribal leaders to begin the tribal nations process, nation to nation process again. Yes, it's very exciting. Just announced yesterday, November 8th, the White House has announced the Tribal Nations Conference, the first time it's been back since Obama introduced it. Um, it was not in place during the Trump administration. It, as I've long said, it is, it is one day, it's going to be virtual, but that one day is really kind of the topper. It's everything that it takes running up to that, the engagement of every agency throughout the administration to show what they're doing for Indian country. That's the real value there. And so I'm glad to see it happening on November 8th. Holly Cook Macaro, thank you so much. Yes, thanks, Mark. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news, go to IndianCountryToday.com. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. This is Indian Country Today.